I want y'all to help me brainstorm something a little bit. Do you, can you help me think of something that is simple, that seems simple, but yet is complicated? Something that's simple, seems simple, but it's complicated. I'm taking, I'm taking names. I've taken suggestions. I, I have a couple I was thinking about. Um, it would seem that the concept of merging when you're driving is a simple concept. It feels like, you know, these are things we learned in kindergarten. You line up, you go one after it. It's easy, right? So simple yet complicated because it turns into a whole another selfish thing that happens among human beings. I don't know. Okay, here's another one. Things that are simple. It would seem those who have kids or children or toddlers or infants or you've babysat or if you've watched someone, it would seem that if this baby or toddler is sleepy, that they would just fall asleep. It's a no-brainer. I'm, when I'm sleepy, I go to sleep. I take, I take my naps. I'm, I will lay down. Something that's simple, but yet for a baby or a toddler, it becomes complicated because they will not go to sleep. I'm a newly minted grandma. I'm, I'm revisiting these problems. They will not go to sleep. Just lay down, little one. Just just go to sleep. Anybody else have an example of a, something simple? Gumbo. It would seem <laughs> that anybody could make gumbo. That ain't my testimony. Mm-mm-mm. It would seem I'm just throwing some things in together. It should come out. No, it's a whole complicated process, starting with the rule. You lost me at the rule. You lost me at the rule. I'm already done. I'm already done. I'm already done. I need a recipe book. Anybody got a good recipe? Holla at me. Anything else? Anybody? Something simple yet complicated? These are things that we wrestle with, we see in our everyday lives. And this is something I want us to talk about today. We're going to talk about something that is a simple concept, but we've made it very complicated. And that thing is called salvation. Somebody say salvation. Now, I don't want you to tune out because some people are like, I'm already saved. I don't need to hear this. No, this is for all of us because can, um, salvation could be a complicated, a complicated um, situation. So we're going to go to the book. Of the, 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 we're going to go to the Bible. This is where we're going to get our answers. And we're going to Romans 10. This is a famous scripture that um, most people use for evangelism. Romans 10, 8. Are you there with me? I'm reading from the NRSV version. Um, And it starts in 8, and it says, but what does it say? The word is near you on your lips or your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart. And so is justified or made righteous. And one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says no one who believes in him will be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. Last verse 13, for everyone. How many people? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord might be saved. That's what it say. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord possibly could be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God bless God's holy word. We're going to talk today about finding rest in salvation. Because we've been on resting, and we've been on wellness, and we've been trying to get our lives right in the end of this pandemic, and we got all this stuff going on. You turn on the news, it's so much, and we're trying to all as a collective um, community find rest, find peace. There's got to be some posture we could take like Jesus on the bottom of the boat when all the waves and the storms are going that you could just pause and rest. There's got to be something in God's presence that we can learn from these lessons. So we're going to talk about the simple yet complicated situation about salvation. The simplest definition I can give you is that um, salvation means to be delivered or rescued from danger. To be delivered or rescued from danger. Basic, basic uh, definition. So then my question to you is, then why is it so complicated? Why is salvation so complicated? 
Well, it all depends on your theology, right? Some people come from uh, uh, where they don't believe in God at all. And they're like, y'all are crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. This Jesus whole thing. Um, I don't believe in salvation. We've got that one end of the spectrum. And then we have people who are like way on the other side. And then everything you do is a sin. Any clothes you wear is a sin. And at any given time, you are at risk of going to hell, depending on what you did, how you acted, what you said, what, how you thought. Anybody from that raise, anybody know about that side? You can't dress, whatever. You always on your way to hell. Something, something every day is going to send you to hell. My God. And then you have somebody who maybe maybe more in the middle where it's like Jesus is a homie type of religion. And like no matter what I do, Jesus is cool with it. I mean, I said the prayer. I got my, you know, get out of hell free card. I'm good. Jesus is Jesus cool with me. I can do whatever. He ain't tripping. Jesus is a homie. So we have this whole spectrum of salvation, right? And you can see how it gets complicated. But let's just go to the word of God. The scripture that we read today is about salvation. It's the simplest, the, the definition that we got was in Romans 10, 9, and 10. You guys go turn to it one more time. Romans 10, 9, and 10. This is where we're going to camp out for today. It says, once again, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Seems simple. You confess and you believe, right? Somebody say confess. Then do you believe? It's a, it's a formula, right? All I got to do is say it and believe it and it's done, right, according to this. But I want you to, to let's look at a deeper meaning of what this could possibly mean. We got the confess part down. If you grew up evangelical, boy, we did altar calls. Oh, my God. I, after we I watched them scary rapture movies, I think I came to like 50 altar calls in a row just in case, Jesus. Like maybe, maybe I didn't phrase it right. I got to say it one more time. Like, please, Lord, come into my heart. Like, so we would, we have these scripted prayers and, you know, we would make it about confessing. We're good at confessing, but then it's the belief part that would get us. So we, when, when I, when I became a Christian back in the good old eighties, you became a soldier in the army of the Lord once you joined. And we had Saturday street witnessing. Anybody used to do that? Saturday street witnessing. We was on, we were Knocking on the same, but head, hi, how are you? So if you were to die tonight, <laughs> y'all remember them days? If you were to die tonight and you're standing before God and he would say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I mean, we would walk up to the folk doors and just uh, ask him random questions. That's what it was all about confessing. We got to get you to say the prayer. We got to just say it. We didn't really care too much about the belief part <laughs> and what happens after. We just want you to just say the prayer and you straight. All right. So, but this is a deeper meaning. I want us to lean into a deeper meaning because every one of us could say Jesus is Lord, right? If you went to anybody affiliated with Acts, I love my Acts Bible Fellowship. If you would say Jesus is Lord, just say it. And you was already on your way to being saved. So everybody here, just say Jesus is Lord. Easy, right? We do it like, like we halfway saved. We just said that, right? But I want you to look at the scripture. Something very is a deeper meaning to what we could just roll off our tongues. We could say Jesus is Lord all day, but for that early church, but for the people who Paul was writing to in the city of Rome, where that church was just started, this was a game changer. This was a life, this is a deal breaker. For them to say Jesus is Lord. So you have to know that Paul wrote this book of Romans probably 40 years after Jesus uh, died and rose again. This is still a fairly new concept. The, the, the people, Jewish people, and uh, even in the city of Rome were under Roman occupation, right? They were, uh, the, Rome was the oppressor. Rome took over. Rome would just roll up into people's countries, kind of like we see in today, and just take over. And just take our, you know, and they didn't care about your religion. Like, go ahead. You could believe whatever you want to believe. Go just, just whatever idol. Make. We'll set up an idol. For what, what's your God name? We'll put it in our temple. Like, we don't care. But once a year, once a year, we're going to need all y'all to say that Caesar is Lord. 
Because in their minds that Caesar, the emperor, whoever was the emperor at the time, was like a god. And you would have to, you have to give homage and say that that Caesar was supreme. You have to give, you got to give all your homage and all your, your, you know, you have to bow down to Caesar. So this became a little problem for the early saints. Y'all see where I'm going, where why this was such a controversy? For them to say Caesar is Lord, they were pressured to saying Caesar is Lord. You're going to, it was on every coin that they wrote, just like we have in God We Trust. They had Caesar is Lord. So everywhere that you go, you saw things that Caesar is Lord. So when people came, this little ragtag group of believers that formed as a new sect, it was like, this is new to the Jewish community. They were like, who are these people? What are they talking about? For them to say Jesus is Lord, to say it out of their mouth, could mean death, could mean imprisonment. If you're a history buff, you know about crazy Nero, the madman who blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome and would persecute the Christians and put them in uh, lion's dens and uh, stadiums and arenas and would burn Christians as light lamps and light posts throughout the city. To say Jesus is Lord, like we just said it so, so easily, was a deal breaker. To confess it out of your mouth. To really say, no, no, Jesus, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. It was a deal breaker. And then that, let's, let's, not add, let's add injury to insult, insult to injury. One of those. Let's, let's go to another level of that is that it says you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead. This was a whole new concept back then. Remember, 40 years removed from Jesus being crucified, this was still a new thing. They looking at they all kind of looking at the like the disciple side eye. Like, so you telling me this dude who y'all was following died. We saw him die and he just disappeared. They're like, no, 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 he rose again. Okay, okay. We know that y'all had somebody steal him. We already know how y'all get down. You ain't gonna trick us. Like they were people did not really believe. They looked like they were running a heist. It looked like they were a cult. It looks like, y'all, what are y'all talking about? No one raises from the dead. Y'all just telling me this man that we saw crucified is alive? Nah, nah, bruh. So for them to say, I believe in my heart that Jesus rose from the dead was game changer. That means that you could possibly be, be disowned by your family, by your Jewish family. You would be disowned from any inheritance, revoked, your friend group, your family group. You could get just cut off and ostracized if you said simple words and simple phrases that we take for granted every day. That Jesus is Lord and that Jesus rose from the dead. It really meant something. It really meant something to them. And it's easy for us to say, but it's hard for us to live. Amen? Because I want to know who is the Lord of your life. I mean, we say it so beautifully, but really, who is the Lord of your life? Because you know, you know what Lord means. Lord means that you have to relinquish control of your life. Like that Jesus is running the stuff in your life. Like Jesus is, you've given control. I'm reporting into you. Jesus is your boss Jesus, I'm running all ideas by you. I'm running all my matters by you. Who is the Lord of your life? Who's running your life right now? Because it's, it's easy for us to look at them or just say this very, you know, easily. But this is the question today for us. You know, that your level of worry will tell on you. Your level of worry will really tell on you about who's really running your life. Because what would your life look like if Jesus really was Lord? Every time you turn on the news that you had in your heart, now I know Jesus is Lord. Every time you open your bank app and you look and you're like, well, you know what? Jesus is still Lord. Every time you open up that app from your doctor and they got another message for you about your results, that Jesus is Lord. Salvation is free. Everybody, everybody agree with that? Salvation is free, but it's going to cost you something. It's simple, but it's complicated. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something to follow. These early saints, they, they were all in. I think that's the component that we miss in this Western society. We believe that salvation 
comes with gumdrops and candy. Like, well, okay, I'm going to get my life, and then what I get back? Okay, so if I do this, then God's going to send me a check, right? Or if I live a beautiful life before God, nothing bad will happen to me, right? So I'll just be comfortable. Once I gave my life to God, my life will be comfortable and easy. We have a weird concept that's moved away from what the early church really believed in. Amen? This is the, this is the part where, comp, where it gets complicated. So let's talk about what salvation is not. Salvation is not works-based, right? It's not based on works. It's not based on performance. And this is where we're going to find our rest because even us who believe in God or maybe believed in the God for a long time, we still have something in us. Maybe it's this Western society. Maybe it's capitalism. Maybe it's something that makes us feel like we got to perform. And God, you know, we kind of feel like God is maybe our Instagram follower and we got to have the, aste- the aesthetics for God to give us some likes, God, I need you to give me some likes today. Maybe if I read my Bible and I'll get some likes from God. Maybe if I, you know, help somebody, I'm going to take a picture of me feeding the homeless. And then I'll get some likes by God. Like we do all these things. We're trying to earn God's approval, trying to earn God's love, trying to make God forget about the sins that we did, trying to be a right person. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And it gets tiring because you can't do all this. It's not based on ourselves. It's not based on our works. So salvation is not based on works. See, this was the Jewish problem in Rome. If you go back and read that whole chapter in verse 10, uh, chapter 10, that's your homework. Read Romans chapter 10. You'll see that in that whole chapter, in in the beginning, Paul was like, man, I really want the, the Jews to be saved. Like they have this zeal for God, but they, their zeal is in the law. So they want to do things. They want to earn their way to God. How many know you can't earn your way to anything? For If you can earn your way into salvation, then Jesus did not need to die on the cross. And if you, if your sin is so bad that you are an exception to the rule that he paid for everybody's sin but yours, come on now. When they, nobody, we are all covered under the same blood. So this is what we're, it's not based on work. So you can relax. We don't have to strive you have to, we have to come into the fulfillment, even those who have been saved for a long time, that you don't have to do anything to earn God's love. There's nothing else you can do to earn God's love. All you can do is be. Everybody say be. I'm just going to be. I'm just going to be. God loves you as you are. Even if you do a, a great things, God will not love you even more, m- more. Even if you do something horrible, God won't love you any less. Sometimes we just need to remember this, that God's not on this scale every day like, oh, how you do today? Mm-mm, I ain't fooling with you. Oh, you read your Bible and you got a badge from the Version app. Oh, good job. I love you again. So we, we put God in our place. We want God to love us like we love other people. But that's not true. God's love is transcendent. So that's what it's not. Salvation is not based on works. But let me tell you what salvation is. And this is going to be a revelation for us. It's going to set somebody free. Salvation is a process. Somebody say a process. Come on. Salvation is a process. So it's once you um, come into the knowledge of God and you believe that Jesus is who he said he was and that he is the Lord and you want him into your life, a process starts. So you have been saved, all right? You are currently saved today, right here, and you are being saved. Amen? We're, we're being saved. We're, 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 one day we'll be saved from ghetto earth. Like, we'll, we'll be done with all this, right? We'll be saved. But see, we're always in these, in these stages. We have been saved. You remember when you did make that commitment. You're currently saved right now, and you're being saved. I've read this great quote. You guys listen to this quote. The most common meaning of salvation is to be saved by God from the consequences of sin. True. But the Bible speaks of our salvation in a bit fuller terms than simply being rescued from hell. So a lot of times that's all we were taught is that just salvation is about get your fire insurance from the Lord. Get your, get your, get your card. Like, get, a, get, get out of hell, right? And that's all we base salvation on is our eternal security. 
which is great. I'm here for it. I'm here for heaven. Sign me up. I, I want to be there with all y'all saints. But maybe, that, maybe we've limited salvation to just that too much. Maybe God wants to save you from other stuff in your life. Maybe God wants to save you from your anger. Maybe God wants to save you from your temper. Maybe God wants to save you from your attitude. Maybe God wants to save us from things that are in danger of putting us in danger, right? So it's not just about the by and by. It's about how can God save us here. When thinking about salvation, it's helpful to think about what are we saved from, what are we saved to, and who are we saved by, it's also helpful to think about our salvation as past, present, and future happening. So, great. You've been saved. Good job. You did it. The people are like, yeah, I used to be out there. I used to be smoking, drinking, gambling, and all that. And that Lord saved me. Okay, cool. To, what did he save you to do what now? What do you, what do you, what do, you do now? Like, I thank you. I love your testimony. But now what are you saved to? We're saved to good works. We're saved to love. We're saved to, for joy. We're saved for peace. Not just we, we're focusing so much about what we used to do that we don't do nothing else. All we got is our testimony from 1983, and I used to be in that club, and I ain't there no more. Okay, but what do you do now? What were you saved from? What are you saved to? And who were we saved by? Because we can't save ourselves. We can't do it, y'all. You could try. You're going you gonna to be tired. How many of you have, have lived that life? I'm just going to be good. I ain't going to do it no more, Jesus. I promise. Okay, this is the last time. Okay, give me one more. I ain't going to do it no more. Like, there's not enough self-willpower that you can muster up that can get you to take the place that Jesus took for you. This is what, about what I said, a timeline. Everybody's on a timeline. Do you know that? You know, what God does, we're all customized. We're not the same. Some people are saved. And immediately, ooh, immediately God took the taste out my mouth. I ain't never walked back in that place no more. That's, a, that's somebody's testimony. God bless you for your immediately. But then there's some of us that are on a timeline, and it's, and it's a progression. It's not an immediately. It's a progression. I'm getting better every day. I'm, I need help from a therapist. I need family and friends and community. I need someone to keep me accountable. There's a different timeline, but the, the thing is, we, we judge people on that immediately. Oh, I thought you were saved. I thought you went to church. I thought, you know, and we don't take into account that everybody's on their own timeline. How many thank God that you have your timeline, that God has left you to find and come into some things and sometimes it takes a while to come into some things, amen? How many of you know like you're not thinking the way you were when you were 20? You're not thinking the way you were when you were a teenager. You're not even thinking the way you did last year. We are all on a timeline and a progression, so that's where it would behoove us not to judge anybody else's timeline. We can't judge nobody. We can't tell nobody else whether they saved or not. We can't. So let we, that's where we need to get away from our self-judgment and thinking, like, I'm going to say who's going to be in heaven and who not. That ain't, none of my, I, that ain't none of my business. I don't have a heaven and hell to put you in. That is, God bless you. You know what my job is? Is to love you while you're here. I'm just going to love you while you're here. So let's get to how the conclusion of this. The conclusion of this is that we can find rest in salvation, right? Just, just, just to know that you are uh, in a place where you can be secure in the works of Christ. And this is something that's so vital. This is like a cornerstone, a cornerstone of your Christian walk. Like, I know this might be foundational for some, but to remember that you have security in Jesus. You don't have to work for God's love that you don't have to pay for your sins. It would be as though you went to Best Buy and bought a big screen TV, and you love it. It's great, and you keep going back to Best Buy. And you're like, I'd like to bring 20 more dollars to pay for my TV. And they're like, ma'am, you just bought it. I love my TV. It's so great. Um, I just want to keep 
coming back and paying for it. What sense does that make, right? But we do God like that. God, I just want to come back and pay for, you know, remember that summer in 86. I just need to go back and make another payment on that just in case you didn't forget. God's like, I've already wiped it out. That You need to lean into the fact that you are secure in your salvation and that Jesus loves you. This is where rest comes in. How do you envision, I say this a lot, but how do you envision that God sees you? When God looks at you, what, how can you picture God's face? A lot of us picture God with a frown or with a lightning bolt ready to strike. Oh, but, 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 what you, oh, mm-hmm, that's what I thought. That's how we have this image of God, that God is constantly scowling at us. But I want you, child of God, to picture right now that every time God looks at you, that there's a smile on God's face. That God is delighted in you. And you don't have to do anything but just exist for God to love you, to God to accept you, for you to have approval in God. But yes, we're on a timeline and we're always progressing. So we don't want to be the saints that say, well, I said prayer and I can pretty much do whatever I want after this. Right? Because that's not a, a real relationship with God. Someone who really appreciates that great salvation someone who really appreciates the, the, the sacrifice that we're going to celebrate, will, won't, won't want to take that for granted, won't want to just live their lives for themselves and just tuck it under like, well, God forgives me. No, you really want God's heart. You really want to make, make God proud. Like this is your heart after you accept who Jesus is, right? So you can be secure in that. And there's the last thing I'll say. Everyone needs their own salvation story. Do you have a salvation story? Do you have a time that you can remember vividly or point? You might not have the date, you know, sometimes dates get blurry, but at least a time in your life where you definitely say, yes, I truly believe in God. Like I I admit that Jesus is the Lord. I want Jesus into my life. Do you remember a time? Do you have a story? Those who are in the chat and are online, do you have a story? If you are, you know, it doesn't even have to be elaborate. I used to be all like, like, my story is not dramatic, and no one would want to know. No, your story is your story, and this is how God fashioned you and to made, made you into. So everybody, have a story. If you have a story, tell your story. Tell somebody how you came to know Jesus. Um, my, my story, really quick, is that I was just seven years old. When I came to know the Lord, my family did not go to church at all. We were the CME Christians, Christ, Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. That was it. That was the only time we went to church. And this particular Mother's Day, um, we went as a family function. But I kept noticing my mom was crying the whole time. You know, I'm being seven. Like, what's her deal? Like, what, what's happening? I don't know what's going on. And a uh, time for the altar call. Y'all remember old school altar calls? It was time for altar call. And my mom leans to us and said, like, hey, I'm going up. Anybody want to go with me? And we were just horrified. Like, oh, no, why would you ask us that? No, no one's walking. I have my cousins with. We're like, no, go, do your thing. And so as she's getting up, I don't know what in me made me hop up with her. But I saw her walking down that aisle, and I jumped, and I ran right with her down that aisle. I didn't even know what I was doing at the time, but that's when they would take you to the other side, and you go over to four spiritual laws. Y'all, anybody know old school church? But I was just seven. But when they explained the gospel to me, I remember vividly understanding. Like, I get this. Like, I want Jesus in my life. Like, yes. Like, Simon, this is why I'm so passionate about Yana and Youth Church, because God can do things in the lives of children. God can really touch hearts and capture hearts at an early age. That night, mm mm-hmm, Jesus knew. Um, That night I was baptized. My dad, (laughs) who was just like everywhere back then, you know, he had to like sober up to come see me get baptized. He ended up getting baptized the same night. And then our whole, like, that was our trajectory. That one day changed our lives. That one day changed our lives. And as a, do you have a story? Do you have a time and can you take your relationship with Jesus so serious that, like the early Christians, you're not just flauntingly saying Jesus is Lord? But if there was a time when someone were to ask you and your life was on the line, could you truly say 
Jesus is Lord with boldness. I'm, I'm fearful of our age that, that we live in because we're still kind of fly-by-night Christians. That if, you know, if that was the case, I don't know how many would stand. I don't know how many really took the serious or really had a personal relationship to the point where I will risk my life for this. Like, I don't know any other thing but Jesus. And this is all I want in my life. Like, I don't know. That's something to think about. Could you really be able to say Jesus is Lord if your life depended on it? Think about it. That's things I want us to take together. Have a story. If you do not have a story, and I'm closing here, and this is for people who are online or people who are here. If you don't have a story, today is a great day to start your story. Today is a great day to say, I want to mark down. I'm going to write it in a Bible. I'm going to put it on paper. Today is March 6th. Today is March 6th. And this is the day that I said, I want Jesus in my life. That I truly believe that Jesus died and Jesus was buried and Jesus was resurrected. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. That means I relinquish control. I'm going to let God direct my life from now on. I'm not going to live for myself anymore. And I want God to put me on a path of discipleship. Like I said, the prayer is not a magic formula. It's a beginning. It's just a beginning. It's just a beginning of your progression in your walk, in your life with God. We're going to go from glory to glory. You're going to learn more and more. But that's what it takes to follow Jesus, right? We're following Jesus. We are being saved. We're being sanctified more and more every day. So let's just stand. Those who are here, those who are at home, if you're here, even in our backyard service, if this is something that you want to do, we're going to dedicate this as holy ground. And this is a day of salvation for those who may not know Jesus and a day of rededication. Remember back in the day, we used to have rededication was a category. You could come down to Al for rededication. My God. We're going back to the old school. If this was a day that you want to rededicate yourself, be like, oh, you know, I, I, I haven't been where I want to be with you. I want to rededicate myself. I want to, I want to get back focused. I want to have a time when I want you to be the priority of my life. I'm tired of doing things my way. I'm trying to earn your, I'm tired of trying to earn your love, to find approval in your sight based on my own works. God, I want to make you Lord of my life. Come on, would you bow your heads? And if this is you, can you just repeat this prayer after me and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. I admit with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I believe that you died, that you were buried and you rose again. So, Lord, I invite you into my life. I invite you into my heart, into my body, my being. Lord, I give you control. I say that you are Lord. I surrender to you. I know this is just the beginning of my journey, but help me to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank God, amen. Can you just begin to?